very dear senior members, Ruth Russell. So to her daughter and son, Jane and James, and their families, and the whole circle of her family and friends, we offer our deepest sympathies. And the funeral is here this afternoon at 2.30. Uh, again, all the regulations, but we'll be using the, the, uh, the 88.1 FM so that people can be as safely distant as well just to give support and to give thanks to God for Ruth's lovely life. And so let's pray. Heavenly Father, you hold all of our souls in life, here in our earthly days and eternally. And so we ask you now for peace and comfort for Ruth's family and all her friends, and for the assurance that she and they are held in your loving arms, now and forever. And we make this prayer in the name of our Saviour, who died and rose again for us. Amen. Look to the Lord and be strong. At all times, seek his presence. So we worship God now as we sing quietly, Speak, O Lord. And let us come to God in prayer. Faithful Father and Lord, our God, we come to you because we trust you even a little and want to trust you more. Help us to grow in trust by opening our hearts to you together in worship now. Prompt us to notice your goodness so that we may turn to you in thanks. And with the insight that gratitude gives us, 
to see your blessings, to see that they are beyond counting, and to know your mercy and loving kindness is such that it never runs out. You hear even the faintest and quietest and most unsure of our prayers as we call to you in the name of your Son. By the help of your Holy Spirit, we are able to pray and we are able to be open to receive your answers. Father, in word and sacrament, you assure us of forgiveness. You nourish us by grace. You surround us with a whole cloud of witnesses in heaven and on earth. And you give us courage through the example of your saints, both those who've already gone ahead of us to eternal rest and those who are around about us here on earth. You remind us of those who have endured to the end, always looking to Jesus, the one who is the way to faith and who completes our faith. You come close to us. You touch us through the love and the care of neighbors and friends and families and indeed strangers. Forgive us for when we allow our worries or distractions to blind us to your faithful care. We bless you for all the ways you come to us and show yourself to us. We pray now that you would open our hearts as we gather here in worship of you this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and together aloud we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So girls and boys of all ages, are you well? Back at school? Is it still very strange or is it kind of getting back to normal? More or less back to normal, is it? Yeah, I think. Okay, good to get normal for you as well? Good, good. Good to hear. Well, today I want you to think about trust. Anybody like to tell me what trust is? What does it mean, trust? Hmm. You know what trust is, but sometimes it's hard to say, isn't it? Or do you know? I'm going to say, Serena? Yeah, you're thinking about it. You know, you know what it is. But anyway, trust is kind. I may, maybe one to say, way to say it. It's like believing somebody even before you can see for sure that it's true what they're telling you. So you, you believe that you say, well, oh, I don't know. I, I don't know how that can be, but well, I trust you, so I believe you. Like for example, let me see. Uh, like for example, this toothbrush. Oh no, hold on a second. That's the wrong one. Wrong one. Maybe it'll do for some of us. This toothbrush. Your mum and dad tell you to brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. Did you brush your teeth? Don't forget to brush your teeth. Have you brushed your teeth yet? Up you go and brush. Always saying that, aren't they? Yeah. And then they say, because, because what? That'll keep your teeth healthy. And you say, will it? Okay. But you only find out that it does keep your teeth healthy when you're older and you've still got some of your teeth anyway and you're doing your best to keep them healthy by brushing them. So you have to trust even though you can't yet see for yourself. You just believe them because you know you trust them. Or here's another thing. Long ago, before there was electricity, people only had candles and lamps and things like that. You had to, to make your room bright at night, you only had things like candles. And that's going to fall Put that back. And then along came some people and said, we've got this new thing. It's called electricity. People said, what? They said, it's called electricity. We're going to come along and we want you to let us put wires into your house. Wires in our house? Yeah, in the walls, covered up. And then you will just have to go click. 
on a switch and the whole room will brighten up. But people weren't used to this at all. They never heard of electricity before. And they said, really? I don't think. You're just making that up. You're having a laugh. That's not true. Is it? Really? Sure, you have to go around and light all the different... She said, no, no, we put in these bulbs. Put in these light bulbs. They're hanging out of the ceiling. And then all you have to do is click. And the whole room brightens up. He said, really? I don't think that could be true. He said, right, we get somebody. Who's going to let us do the first house? And we'll show you. And everybody can see. Then you can all join in. So they got the first house in a village. You know, they went around to each village and they got the house, uh, all, all the wires in it and everything. They said, right, now, who's going to be the person to press the switch? And you all practice, put your hand and go, click, and see what happens. He said, who's, who's going to switch it on? So somebody said, oh, oh I'll do it. And they went over and said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe the house will blow up if I press that button. He said, no, no, it won't. You just have to, just have to press it. Okay. Oh, I'm not too sure about this. And then somebody else said, look, come on, we'll do it together. One, two, three. Click. And the whole room brightened up. So somebody had to... First of all, trust to let them put in the wires into the house. But trusting also meant that they had to click that button. They had to do a little thing to let the light come into the house. Now, I was thinking of that because Jesus said, even if you only have a tiny little bit of faith, God will do the rest. God will do amazing things if you have a tiny little bit of trust. If you will just trust God enough to call on God, even if you're not sure if God is there, to say, God, are you there? Even if you think God might love you, to say, God, do you love me? Even if you think that God mightn't be able to help you, to say, God, Will you help me? It's just a tiny little bit that you need to do. And God will do all the rest. So Jesus was saying, you just have to have that much faith. God will do all the rest. And you know, that's when you find out. And you can tell your friends, you can say, no, really, really, God, God will help you. But you have to just say, God, will you please help me? You just have to do a tiny little bit of faith. And God does all the rest. And if you don't even know how to trust, or you can't trust, you can say, God, will you help me to trust? So God will even give you that gift. So let's do that now. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for all the things that you teach us all the time in the Bible and in our hearts as well. So help us to have just that little bit of faith to talk to you every day and to listen to you so that we can see that your promises are true by trusting you, even just a little bit, and letting our trust grow more and more all through our lives. Amen. So now we're going to sing, I am so glad.
Our scripture reading this morning is from Luke's Gospel at chapter 17 and reading from verses 5 to 10. So let's listen now for God's word to us through the scripture. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. Amen. And may God bless to us this reading from his word. You know the way you sometimes meet someone who has astonishing faith? I remember one woman that I met in Montana when I spent a summer placement there with the Presbyterian Church. Alma was crippled with arthritis pains. She really couldn't go anywhere. Days she couldn't even get out of bed. But twice a week, she hosted a prayer lunch. She got her family to buy corn doggies. And she probably had other food as well, but that's the one I remember because I'd never before, indeed, or since had a corn doggy. Do you know what a corn doggy is? No? I, it's a kind of like a hot dog on a stick. I think it's a sausage on a stick and it's got kind of cornbread around it or something. Anyway, it was instant food. That's the real thing. So teenagers who were in a school nearby, they, were, they would come in and workers who worked in offices nearby or workplaces nearby, they would come in. Uh, just anybody who was free to come came. And um, while we were having a quick lunch, we were all praying. People prayed for all sorts of concerns nearby and far away, personal things or things that were on the news. But as I remember it, it was always Elma who led the prayers of praise and thanksgiving. In spite of all our pains and all the limitations they placed on her. And you know, her faith helped everyone's faith to grow stronger and to have courage in face of difficulties, knowing that God is with us. Or indeed to feel our joys more fully as we praised and thanked God for the good times and the happy events rather than just taking them and not hardly noticing them. We've all met people who've kept on trusting God and whose faith seems to shine and grow even stronger even when they have been through the mill, through very hard times. Or again, some of the stories behind well-known hymns with great messages, the, the, the stories themselves behind the hymn are just wonderful messages of faith in themselves. We're all familiar with Joseph Scriven from Bambridge, who out of terrible personal tragedy and loss wrote, what a friend we have in Jesus. It was a reflection of his own experience of how Jesus was very close to him when he called on him in his hour of great need and distress. And that's a hymn that has helped many a struggling soul. God has reached to and touched many a struggling soul ever since. I used to, when I was in Edinburgh, we used to uh, have a work with people who lived on the streets and we had a little service uh, as part of it. And whatever else we did, we always had to sing that hymn. They always said we need that, that hymn. It really touched them. And another hymn that continues to touch many of us all around the world was also written as a response of faith to devastating personal and family tragedy. It's, it is well with my soul. A deeply moving cry of faith, even in extreme suffering. Amazing faith. And then... There are those whose astonishing faith empowers them to step out into the unknown, to leave behind all the comforts and the security and sureness of home, certain of nothing 
except that God is with them. Like a woman I know called Helen, she completed her, as she was just coming towards the end of her degree in maths, in mathematics here in Northern Ireland, she began to feel that God was calling her to work as a translator with the Bible Society. She was really puzzled by this. So she called into the Bible Society because the, the, the sense of call didn't go away. And she explained that this was how she was feeling and she was feeling God calling her, but didn't seem to understand it because she was a mathematician, not a linguist. They looked at her in amazement and said, you are an answer to our prayers. There's an Amazon a group of tribal Amazon people. They have no Bible in their own language because nobody yet has fully understood or written down their language. And apparently it turned out that mathematical skills are what is needed for analyzing a new language and being able to work out the grammar and so on. So after a period of preparation, she set off four miles down river, down the Amazon, from the nearest small village. And she was aged 21. And you could listen forever to her stories of her years, indeed her decades, with this beloved tribe many of whom found great peace and help and joy and hope in coming to Christ, as well as learning from her practical skills that enabled them to hold their own when people from the outside world began to approach them and began to encroach and try to cheat them in all kinds of ways. Great faith stories. And you wonder, how do people have that kind of faith? When we listen to their stories, maybe like the disciples in our reading, we want to ask Jesus, could you make our faith greater? Make my faith greater? And maybe his answer to them is the same answer he gives to us. You know, even the tiniest grain of faith is enough. Because God's power doesn't depend on our faith. It's the other way around. Our faith, even if a small amount of faith, gives us just enough to enable us to trust and depend on God. Maybe just enough to take that small step of calling out to God. And you know, often when you get close to people whose faith seems so enormously greater than our own, they'll tell you that actually, at the time, they had very little, just a tiny grain of faith, just enough to turn to God. I'm thinking of a young woman, I'll call her Olga, she's not from around these parts. She had, contrasted, she had contracted some virus of some sort abroad and gradually her health just deteriorated to the point where she needed a wheelchair. Many people continually prayed for her. And one evening, she got a phone call inviting her to join some friends in a ministry of healing service. <coughs> Later, she admitted that she actually only went to please these friends because she didn't really think that it would make any difference. But the thing is, she had enough faith, however small, to actually go and let them pray. And she did receive a huge amount of physical healing, but also a huge peace in herself. And she has lived a life of faith ever since. But what I'm saying and what she was pointing out is that the healing was not because of her great faith. She only had a little bit of faith, just enough to act on it by going to this prayer meeting. She took that step though, and God did all the rest. And many people will tell us a similar story. Sure, you probably have stories like that in your own life. It's not about the faith being so enormous. Often it's quite the opposite. But it is about having just enough to, to take that little step of faith. Or to respond even with a first tiny step in the direction that God is calling them. Everything that happens next the direction of their life, how others respond, how things fall into place, all of that is to do with God. 
their grain of faith was just enough to open them up to God's love and God's guidance and God's healing in their lives in some way. And in fact, even that little grain of faith is God's gift. Sometimes the mustard seed, you know the way sometimes a grain is too, you're trying to pick it up, it's too small, you just can't get that tiny little seed in between your fingers. You can't get a grip of it. And when we can't even have that tiny grain of faith, we need to ask God for the gift of faith. Or when we're not even sure if we want it, do I really want to trust? Do I really want to follow you, God? to ask for the desire to have that grain of faith, that gift of faith. All of it is God's gift, all of it. But it is a gift. It's never an imposition. God does not treat us as robots to be programmed. God doesn't want automatons. God wants relationship with real people, us. Much as God yearns for us to accept his love, to trust him, even with that tiny little bit of faith, God will never force us. It's always our choice how we respond to his love or how we accept his power to work in us and through us. Because in responding to God, we also open up our lives for God to reach to others through us. It's often been said that the only Bible many people will read is the lives of Christians. God knows we're not perfect. And in a way, you know, it can be a bit off-putting when people go around giving the impression that they are perfect. It kind of makes you feel like you could never be in their league. What God does ask of us is to be people of faith, people who trust that God still loves us even though we're far from perfect. People who trust that God forgives us so that we can find the freedom to actually face up to our mistakes, to own them, to admit them, and can find the freedom of hope and the freedom of courage to start again rather than giving up because we've messed up. Real faith shows up as trusting that we are loved and forgiven rather than showing up as pretending to be perfect. And that gives us room to be real with each other and with all our neighbours and to encourage one another and to bear one another's burdens. Just as Jesus is real with us and has borne and still bears all our burdens. We can't grow in faith when we go around trying to pretend that we're perfect or when we deny that we are imperfect. That's true at a personal level and it's true in the bigger picture. If you just think of South Africa and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was led by Archbishop Desmond Tutu, there can't be healing of a disease until we dare to admit that we have a disease and are prepared to look at it and see what it is. And just a wee thought about those last verses that kind of seem a bit strange from our cultural point of view, seem a little harsh, the bit about the master and the servants. But the real point that Jesus was making in those verses, the real thing he was saying that was more easily stood in their, understood in their culture than in ours, but the point is, the point is that God is never in our debt. We never do more for God than God has done for us. God never owes us one. Our response of living as Jesus followers is always just that. It's always a response, a response of love to the far greater, vastly greater love that has been shown to us. God's joy in us, God's care for us, God's forgiveness of us, God's love for us, it's always vastly greater than anything we can respond with. It's kind of like comparing an ocean with a teaspoon. 
And faith itself is God's gift to us. We can't even take credit for that. So the disciples are completely right when they asked for more faith. It wasn't something they could do themselves. It's all God's gift. And yet, our part is to be open to receive that gift, to ask for that gift if we don't have it, to ask to want that gift if we hardly even want it. And we do that by coming together to worship as we're doing now or as we're doing by technology for those who'll be listening to the recording. To do that by prayer, to do that by studying the scripture through which God speaks to us. And to do that in how we speak to and treat all our neighbors, trusting even when we don't fully understand. And may God bless us and increase our faith each day. And let's pray. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. For me, be it Christ, be it Christ hence to live. If Jordan above me shall roll, no pang shall be mine, for in death as in life, thou wilt whisper thy peace to my soul. But Lord, tis for thee, for thy coming we wait. Heaven, not the grave, is our goal. O trump of the angel, O voice of the Lord, blessed hope, blessed rest of my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trumpet shall sound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Lord Jesus, help us to grow in wellness by following you in loving God and this world. We pray for the peace of the world, especially we pray for those places experiencing war or conflict and violence or troubles. We pray for the places that are in the news, but also those places that are not in the headlines, but where the suffering is nonetheless real. We give thanks for all who work to build peace. We pray your hand upon them to give them wisdom and energy and the hope and vision that they need. We also pray for leaders and for ourselves that we would continually do all we can for the well-being of future generations as well as our own. And as we go on this journey of re-emerging from restrictions, we pray for our own land and for our church. Thank you for the blessings that we enjoy, for friendliness, for those who, who, who work to meet the needs of our young people and our older people and those who've come recently to our shores, as well as the various traditions in our society. Help us to find ways to appreciate each other and to enrich each other with our different gifts and outlooks, that we may all be the better off because of each other. Bless all who are ill, those who are suffering in any way, and those who are bereaved, particularly we think of Jane and James and their families, all of Ruth's family in this time. Bless and guide our families and our friends, our neighbors nearby and far away. And thank you, Lord, for all the opportunities you give us to take part in your purpose, for people you give us to care for, for the work and the ways that we can contribute in our homes, in our church, 
and our wider community. Thank you for all who love us and who care for us in so many ways. Thank you for your own love which surrounds us, giving us comfort and strength as we trust and follow our Saviour. Help us all to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also. People who will take that step of faith. Not just to say, yes, Lord, but also to obey you. And thank you for the hope that you give us in this life and for all eternity. And we make our prayers in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So we sing, O God of faith. And now go back out into the world in trust to love and serve God and your neighbours. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>